Hello and welcome to Undisciplined episode 11. I'm your host as always, and for the first time, I'm introducing myself as Dr. Nico Beitendach. And today, I am speaking to Professor Matthew Edney from the University of Southern Maine. Professor Edney is well known as the editor of the History of Cartography project, and he also has a new book out that came out late last year, 2020, called Cartography, the Ideal and its History. Professor Edney also has a very active blog at mappingasaprocess.net. I'll have links for all of these in the episode description. It's a long episode packed full of good stuff, so I don't want to waste time. Let's get straight into it. Have fun. Professor Edney, thank you very much for speaking to me on my podcast. It's a great honor to have someone of your stature talking to me. Um, You recently published a book called uh, Cartography, the Ideal and its History. And I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that you offer in the book, but also more generally some of your earlier work and other work that you also do. So you, you've given your professional life to cartography. You say you love maps since childhood and you're working on the history of cartography project. And yet uh, you've made the statement that it's time to kill cartography. I'm guessing, or I know that there is something deeper or more nuanced underneath that statement, but do you mind telling me why you say it's time for us to kill cartography and then what you really mean by that? Sure. Um, That's actually the point that's gotten most feedback uh, about this book. Um, I'm guessing that when when you wrote that, you expected for some people to uh, choke in their coffee. Sure. Or, yeah, yeah <laughs> there, there, there was a polemical edge there, I must admit. Um, no, the, the, I should have been a bit clearer, maybe, um, less polemical, and say that, uh, that what needs to be killed are all the misconceptions and... Uh, inadequate concepts that the ideal of cartography has promoted. The whole point of this book is to argue that cartography itself doesn't actually exist, so you can't actually kill it. Um, you know, Cartography is, in Baudrillard's terms, a simulacrum. It's not something that obscures uh, something else. It's not an image that obscures truth. It's an image that obscures the absence of truth. And in this case, uh, what, we, what we really have in actuality are myriad ways of mapping, myriad forms of maps made from physical objects in the landscape, from human performance with the body, or uh, oral statements, written statements, graphic statements um, that combine in different ways within different communities when they're talking about different kinds of conceptions of space. Mm -hmm. And so really what we have is myriad forms of mapping, but modern Western culture has created this mythic ideal of cartography that is a once a universal subject that every that that every civilization has made maps is one of the ways you can uh, anthropologically define a civilized society it has graphic maps but at the same time civilized uh, civilization sorry cartography is understood to be a specifically modern western phenomenon and so you have this uh, right from the start. You have this 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 competition between uh, a concept of cartography as a universal ideal of humanity versus a specific formation of of Western modernity, nationalism, and imperialism. And it's exactly the same kind of dichotomy that you see in the concept of landscape, uh, Bill Mitchell's work, where landscape is at once a universal 
but at the same time, it is a um, specific formation of modern Western uh, culture. Uh, discovery is the same thing, uh, and so on. We can talk about it. I mean, art, for that matter, and architecture uh, are considered to be universals, yet at the same time, they're very particularly modern constructs. Um, that's because in every other one of those fields, landscape, art, architecture, uh, is recognized that the modern formation is a modern idealization. We just haven't made that realization for cartography, and that's what the book is about. So as I say in the epigraph to the chapter one, uh, stealing shamelessly from Steve Shapton's book on the scientific revolution, there is no such thing as cartography, and this is a book about it. No, I really like that. So I think what's clear to me is that maps and cartography are, can I say, very slippery objects that they define easy definition and within themselves they can sustain a lot of paradoxes. For example, you also say that they're not only material, but they can be performative. And you also say that there's the conception of the map as a scientific instrument. You use the example of a thermometer. And then you also say, perhaps from my legal background, which is interesting, that you draw comparison to the map to Bentham's Panopticon. Yep. Do you mind saying a little bit, you say that this this edifice of cartography, what what are some of the other perhaps common common ideas or common misconceptions that people have a layman would have of what a map is sure so um if you look at at dictionary definitions of a map and if you're an academic then you should never actually look at a dictionary definition right. of a map because they're written by lexicographers who, who know language they don't know jargon um so a map is always defined as uh something that is a, a picture or a representation or an image of the world or a part of it or a part of the heavens or a part of in fact I've, over the, over time in the 19th century you can actually see these like these these dictionary definitions get more and more complex as the lexicographers realize, oh, but there's mind maps, so that's not a part of the surface of the Earth. That's a part of the, un the you know. And how do you talk about a geological map of substrata? Mm. And so on. Anyway, um, the naive understanding of a map, at least as we are educated into it in modern Western culture, is that maps are properly accurate delineations of spatial relations, shall we say, uh, a depleted homologue of the world, to quote, um, I'm blanking on his name, um, he's in the book. So from this, I mean, this is in, in effect, but just one or two aspects of, um, of the ideal of cartography. The ideal of cartography is a, is a web of, um, preconceptions it's an entire belief system and the different preconceptions have have formed historically for different reasons uh and so they they often contradict each other so one of the the simplest contradictions is in the possibility of a map at one to one that the map is the, the same size as the earth itself i.e the map replicates the earth so on the one hand, this is a logical extension of the map is a measured representation of the Earth's surface, and representation there being used to mean a, a mimetic uh, yeah. image. Uh, so that, yeah, I mean, if you were to measure the world as closely and as in great as great detail as possible, you could map it at a at the you can map the Earth at the same size as the Earth itself. But against that, you run into a whole different body of a part of the belief system in which maps are intended to be guides. Maps are, are necessarily simplifications of the world in order to help people use the world, and in particular, to help people navigate through, move through space. So the first body of thought is very much a, a creation of the 18th, 30, 19th century. 
and the growth of systematic territorial mapping, Ordnance Survey in the UK, um, Cassini surveys in France, and so on. The second body of, of belief comes from the rise of personal mobility with uh, bicycles and then automobiles in the late 19th, early 20th century, when people started to use certain kinds of maps in very guided instrumental ways. And so when you saw and then also as with the, with the, with the post-war rise of hiking and orienteering, um, then the topographic mapping of your military becomes very much, a, 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 again, an instrumental guide to moving through um, detailed spaces on foot. So in the public popular conception, then maps become a form of um, simplification to aid human endeavors, to, to aid the manipulation of space and the modification of space. So you then put these two bodies of thought together and they collide. So this is why uh, Lewis Carroll and then Borges and Umberto Eco have all had these, these um, satires on the map of one-to-one -one because they play on the contrast between two completely different conceptions that have evolved or formed within modern culture about the nature of maps. And it's this multiplicity of belief that I think in part explains why the myth of cart the ideal of cartography is so persistent. I call it intellectual whack-a-mole. As soon as you, you slap down one preconception, another one comes popping right back up. Mm. Uh, so for example, uh, one scholar says, you know, uh, he and a colleague, no, we, uh, we completely reject the idea that maps are pictures. Mm. And you know, because in colloquial usage, you had all these, all these different kinds of people talking about the map as an image of, the, of a picture of the world. And look at the map right. and we can see the world through it. So they, so they reject that prop proposition. And instead, they immediately say, no, what maps are, maps are all about location. Hmm. And they they go right back to the to what I call the ontological preconception, uh, that the maps are defined by how they uh, record and present not just locations but things at locations, propositions about locations in this case, um, and fine, you know that accounts for a larger number of the maps that one can site but it doesn't account for all of them right uh and so every time you 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 start to pin down a definition then it's so easy to come up with well what about this kind of map it's accepted as a map but it doesn't fit your definition because people keep thinking about the map as if it is a a, a coherent and consistent category that we can we can define that category and be, by defining that category of things we define cartography. Hmm. But in reality, cartography is the belief system that holds there is a single category of things called maps. Yeah. And we need to get away from the belief system so we can get away from the belief that there's a single category of things called maps. So in a way, what I'm arguing is what some people would talk about in terms of decentering the map. I often like to think about it as, as saying we need to take the map off the pedestal. Uh, you know, before the '80s, the map was put up on a pedestal as a as an image of science, an image of civilization. Uh, after the 1980s, a lot of people put the map not on a pe pedestal, but on a but high up on stock, so they could throw rotten fruit and vegetables at it. No, no, no. We need to pull the damn thing off the stocks, off the pedestal, yeah, and bring it back into the realm of human culture. Yeah. So th that's also the approach. Um, what did you call it before? The the map is bad. Right. So yeah. So one the of the big bad. maps are bad. The maps are bad syndrome. To quote Martin Bruckner. Yes. And this is one of the things I'm working on right now in the in the, in the follow up book. Um, so if you look at a lot of the um, there's a lot of theory and postmodern commentary um, 
that use map because because of Africa, Korsipska's quote, the map is not the territory, which people today tend to limit to just that phrase, the map is not the territory. Originally, Korsipski went on longer because he, I mean, he's writing about the same time that Magritte is painting pictures of pipes and saying, this is not a pipe. I mean, a very, uh, a very simple but effective critique of the idea of mimetic representation. And that is what, that's what Kozybski is trying to get at. It's that the map is not a mimetic image of the world. But he goes on to say, in this preconception of efficacy, that if a map has the same structure as the world, then it is useful and correct. So for, for Kozyb- Kozybski, was an archly modernist, not, po- not postmodernist in the way he's been utilized. But anyway, but the postmodern move has latched onto this phrase and onto maps generally as a way to problematize the nature of representation um, to the point where representation itself is almost a useless word now because it means so many different things. So you, but you can find then people like, for example, David Harvey in the condition of postmodernity who has a, a key moment drawing on um, Henri Fevre, drawing on a, the, the idea of space-time compression, in which he, he is, it becomes a very map-centered argument that over, from the Middle Ages on, uh, technology has led to a uh, compression of the experience of space and time that has turned modern culture away from a more authentic, a more sensitive appreciation of the landscape. And he puts up, in, in, in contrast to, to modern cartography, he puts up the contrast of, of, of images of what he calls the sensuous images of landscape, images that give you a sense of the, the, the curvature of the earth, and I'm being explicitly hinting here at, at uh, pornographic representations of women because that's part and parcel of this whole issue. But then you realize that what Harvey is arguing here is something that is actually been, been argued by other geographers, cultural geographers of the um, humanistic variety who see maps as being sterilizing and totalizing and so on, uh, sterile views of, of, of space. Um, that deny any kind of, of personal cultural authenticity and is grounded in an understanding of the history of, of cartography that is, when Harvey was writing, about 140 years old. Frederick Jameson, um, postmodern condition, does exactly the same thing, uses a somewhat different history of cartography uh, that emphasizes the medieval rise of marine mapping in, in medieval Europe as a way to construct a history of modern versus the postmodern. And all of these rely on this idealization of cartography as if what cartography claims to be is actually real. And I'm not saying that there are not totalizing forms of mapping. I mean, that is absolutely the case. What what I'm really arguing is that's just one kind of mapping, and we need to analyze that mapping in terms of the producers, the consumers, the circulation material of of the maps themselves, um, and not conflate all other kinds of mapping with it. So forgive me, I'm saying this slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it sounds a little bit like the, let's say, the, the pro-gun activists in the United States who say that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Could you say, because I'm saying this also in reference to the first text of yours that I read was uh, the irony of imperial mapping. Mm-hmm. Right. So, the, so the, well, in the irony of imperial mapping, the whole point there was to say, well, what is imperial mapping? <laughs> Right. What is mapping? What is empire? Both of them are utterly uh, contested concepts. 
you can't find anybody who comes up with a with a universal definition of empire other than something so broad like it's a political system of unequal power that's all political systems yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the same thing with mapping um so what is it that 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 defines the mapping that goes on in specifically 19th century uh european overseas colonial efforts because when you look at it in terms of the technology of mapping there's little in terms of the power relationships that differ between uh let's say what the french were doing in france in the 18th and 19th century and what the french did in egypt around about 1800 or what the british were doing in britain and what the british did in india um in the sense that the the technologies of mapping were the same, but also the institutional structures were similar and the relationship of the surveyors to the local populations was very similar. So in France, for example, you have your surveyors going around, but in order to understand what they're looking at, they're talking to local curates and you know, the local uh, parish priests and the local aristocrats, landlords. And the British did the same thing in Britain and Ireland and, and India. Um, the French did the same thing in Egypt. And in a way, it is a process that co-ops local elites to the, to the central or government institutions as they're developing so that those elites are partaking of the larger power structure but then it's a question of who's actually using, able to access and to consume the final maps. And that's where the irony comes in, in the sense that the irony of empire and of imperial mapping is imperial mapping is mapping by a power for the power, regardless of the people being mapped. Whereas, you know, the state mapping is the people being mapped are the people who are also using the, the maps. So there's a, there's a sort of a dramatic irony there. Um, the, it's the pattern of consumption that defines um, the power relations. Well, the power relations define the pattern of consumption. Either way, I mean, it's tautologous. Uh, it's not that the mapping itself is necessarily evil so and this is coming back to the whole issue of you know, guns don't kill people people kill people um yeah you can kill people with a knife it's just darn sight easier with a gun especially a machine gun and, and and so on um that's nothing about that is to say we can't still then regulate guns in the same way that we shouldn't regulate map making mm. in fact we do regulate map making as part of the whole ethos of it so yeah one one of my it doesn't quite rhyme with the conclusion that you drew in in the irony of mapping but when you pointed in the article and speaking now that you said that the pr process or the technology or the the skills that we use to map empire is the same that was used domestically by imperial states and my first thought was well then perhaps domestic mapping too is imperial you know that or Mm -hmm. the, uh, my anarchist tendencies tells me, well, then <laughs> that just proves that uh, states also colonize their own populations. Just, yes. It's just a matter of chronological order. No, I th I, you're absolutely correct. Um, mapping, that this particular kind of mapping uh, is thoroughly implicated in formation of modern states and in formation of modern empires. Um, as it happens, different, you know, older forms of, call them empire because that's conventional, uh, have different kinds of mapping structures. But, I mean, one thing is for certain, you, 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 you don't have a state or an empire, you don't, I, you don't have any kind of large political entity without some kind of communication flow. And the communication flow is based on the social relations. So if you have a, a, an empire, let's say the Mughal Empire, pre-British Empire in India, um, had maps, yes. Um, 
but the flows of information were structured along a more 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 of a feudal line um, where the empire the emperor didn't have to worry about the details of what's going on in every province he just had to worry about the landlords in every province so this is a hierarchization it's a it's a manifestation of, of modernity that that hierarchy gets flattened as a centralizing state whether it's a, a state or an empire, uh, the, the, the centralizing authorities uh, claim more and more and more information and, and, and knowledge, or think they know about, the, the details of the people and what the people are engaged in, agriculturally, economically, culturally. Um, it's, so modern cartography is a... Is a, a and the, the kinds of, of systematic territorial mapping uh, that modern states and modern empires have engaged in are part of this process of flattening political um, institutional hierarchies. Yeah, something that's, that I'm also hearing now that I've really enjoyed about your work is that where traditionally people would focus on either the... Uh, the people making the maps or commissioning the maps and then the consumers on the other hand where you place quite an emphasis on also the distribution of maps i'm right. speaking specifically of the 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 printing industry so when you also say that big political entities and the modern nation state re relies on information and communication then uh immediately like i i i see the link to the emphasis that you place on on printing and publication of maps as a, as a crucial actor in the history of cartography. Right. So well, there's, there's several aspects to that. One, one is historiographic. Um, until really the, say, 1980, um, the history of cartography was written as the history of map production. There were some biographical works of people who made maps, but mostly it's about what maps were made of which territories and where did the data come from the revolution of the 80s intellectual revolution of the 80s um, turned attention to the consumption of maps the use of maps maps as uh, the the way maps are read as cultural documents the way they're used as social instruments um, which is why i call this the social cultural approach to mapping what i'm trying to say is Okay, if you, if you, well, at a basic level, this whole approach grew out of a frustration because people say, oh, look, here's a map. It means this to everybody in 16th century France, whenever. And I'm immediately like, yeah, but which people would have seen that map? So you start to get, like historians of the book have done, very much into the materiality of the maps or the immateriality for that matter, depending on particular spatial discourses you're working in. And so you start to see that maps, that the map itself doesn't occur in and of itself in some kind of unique way. The maps occur in circulation with a plethora of other kinds of texts. And then you can start to see that there are patterns in this. So what you can call geographical mapping, regional mapping, world mapping, mapping of the world, which is not to say what the world is, but how the world ought to be. That kind of mapping is part and parcel of all the other representations dealing with knowledge of the earth, uh, so geography, generally speaking. So it's part of education, it's part of uh, state knowledge, princely knowledge, it's part of military, logistical, strategic knowledge and so on. And each of those different sort of subsets of communities are making particular kinds of geographical maps for themselves. And so when you when you read uh, accounts in the 80s and 90s and well actually to the to the present that just talk about here's a map, this is how it would have been read. Um, you then got to start asking the question, well okay, so who else would have seen it? And it also starts to break apart the old nice and neat chronologies of mapping um, that we have pre-1980s. So the assumption is somehow, and this again is one of the preconceptions of the ideal of cartography, 
that the goal of mapping, once printing was developed, was to print the map so as to disseminate it as broadly as possible. And I'm saying, well, maybe, but then there's sort of an, uh, an aspect of, of cost and which people can afford to buy the maps. And also, is there a question, is there other values to printing that are different from simple dis altruistic dissemination, publicity in the modern sense? And so, for example, I came across, um, wrote a rather fugitive piece on a series of maps of New England that were printed in 1740s, 1730s, 1740s, and all in London mostly, that were not intended to be sold on the public marketplace. They were printed because they had to go uh, together with printed legal documents that were printed in very small quantity that were made for the Privy Council to hear boundary disputes in the colonies. And there's a, a, a sense of stability about the print image, that the print image hasn't been modified in a way that a manuscript can be so easily modified. And so they wanted print manuscripts, print work, sorry, to uh, create a stable and definitive statement of the issues at play, even to the point where there, were, there was a, for example, in Rhode Island, there was a 1720 manuscript map that was cited by the Privy Council in 1720. Well, in 1722, as this defines the boundaries. So in 1740s, it gets reprinted, but the printing is done in such a way to try to really capture the manuscript qualities, especially the use of color in the original manuscript from 20 years earlier. But it had to be printed nonetheless, even though it was only going to be made in like 10 copies, 15 copies. So anyway, this is one little very, very minor example um, of the fact that just because a thing is printed doesn't mean it's necessarily published. And by implication, just because it's published doesn't mean that something is distributed as broadly as we might assume. And so what I've come to, to argue is that by trying to reconstruct from material quality and from whatever archival evidence we can find, by reconstructing how the maps themselves moved through space between producers and consumers, we can come up with very mo much more precise understanding of the communities that were making and using maps so that we can then refine our interpretations of the meanings of those maps uh, so they're actually really appropriate and historically valid. You know, one of the problems, again, one of the, the several preconceptions of the ideal of cartography is the, is the preconception of materiality. The idea that uh, the map is necessarily a, a strictly material thing and that the map that the the map ends at the boundary of the paper, at the edge of the paper or the neat line. But when you actually start looking at how maps work in books, in particular, very unstudied phenomenon, then you start realizing that you can't draw such a nice hard and fast edge semantically between the map and the book it's part of or all the other books it is circulating in the same discourse with. But in the preconception of materiality, it really creates this idea that, that there are two epochs to any map. There's the, there's the epoch of the map's creation. Um, so you can imagine a circle of information flowing between different people, the, the engravers, the designers, the patrons, and the commissioners, um, and so on, until ultimately this thing is created. And then there's a second circle of how the thing then circulates amongst consumers. And you see this, this, this structure, this chronological bifurcation into these two epochs, before and after the map. You see it in all sorts of things. We see it in the insistence in by most map scholars uh, to distinguish between map making and map using. You can see it in the work even of Dennis Cosgrove. Um, yeah, Dennis Cosgrove, a brilliant, brilliant scholar, 
wedded to it. Gillian Rose, brilliant scholar of visual culture, still wedded to it. But in graphic form, and because we're on a verbal po- podcast here, but what I've tried to do is describe there are two circles that are separate, and but they're joined by a single line. For all the world, to me, that that's a pair of handcuffs that, that intellectually lock us into this position. But what I'm arguing is, no, we the the map itself is the thing that is circulating, not the information. The information is this abstraction that we're helped on. It's the map itself that is circulating. So to understand how the map circulates between producers and consumers, you have to understand the form of the map. Is it strictly material? Is, does it have personal, performative, gestural, verbal elements? Does it have any material element whatsoever? Some maps don't. Um, and that shapes how the, communica- how the, how the network, is, the, the communication circulation is going to run. So um, if you're going to pin me down to, to, to say what philosophical standard theory do I, do I ascribe to, um, I'm pretty wide-ranging. Um, but I would say that this, this argument that mapping is, a, is process is a, a form of what's either called non-representation or post-representational theory. I mean, this goes back to a fundamental dissatisfaction with, I mean, we, we can keep talking about what maps mean to the cows come home, but there's also the fact that maps are used to kill people indirectly. They're used to liberate people. They're used to do all sorts of things in the real world. Maps have historical consequences. How do we study that? How can we understand that, that those consequences and how they come from uh, geographical forms of, of discourse, or spatial discourse? So part of the, the, the non-representational, post-representational, I think I prefer post, um, is the idea that the map is always becoming. You know, Adam Pred, the geographer, had an article back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, called Places Becoming, which, when I've had my students read it, sort of blows their minds, and then they get it, and it's like, ooh. You know, up until that point, people kept talking about places being these fixed things. Um, the, the meaning of place was somehow static and had been created, and now here it is. And Pred says, no. Places are becoming, they, continue, they don't be, they, they become. They're continuing, the process, I mean, is in, in a way, it's just like natural science. Now, back in the early 19th century, uh, Charles Lyell, I think it was Lyell, argues that the, the same physical processes we see in operation today are the same things we saw in the past. Mm. And it's not like, there's some kind of religious dispensation which requires some different kind of process in the past, like the Great Flood um, mm. and other kind of miraculous things. Uh, so we can we can understand past even past physical processes by the present physical processes. And so what Pred is doing is inverting that by saying, well, no. It's not that there are these past processes that created the sense of, of a particular place to then stop. No, those processes are continuing. And those processes entail the people who live in a place, the people outside the place looking in from the outside, how they are construing the meaning of these places. Mm-hmm. So that meaning is not something that is created and fixed, but meaning is, in a representation is something that is continually being renegotiated, reinterpreted, reproduced by the viewer. And so the essence of a post-representational approach to cartography, whether you're talking about the work of Martin Dodge or Tanya Rosetto, and I highly recommend Rosetto's work, um, is that the meaning of a map is not defined by the maker. The meaning of the map is created by the consumer. And when you have that old dichotomy of map user, map, map maker, map user, then it doesn't allow you 
to to understand the relationships of the consumer and the producer because it's setting up you, you you're splitting them apart you're denying the the role of the consumer as an active participant in in spatial communication mm-hmm. this this really came to me um i encountered a book um it's a long story but it's a brilliant book by jeremy smith who's an historical linguist at glasgow uh writes writes on um studies uh medieval english and the shift from anglo-saxon to to early modern to chaucerian english and he wrote a book called an historical understanding of the english language which is not a a history of the English language. It's a it's an epistemological statement of how do we understand the English language such that we can tell its history in a productive way. And that's really the as it happens where I began this this whole project that the cartography book is the first part of. Um, it began as an historical understanding of cartography. Um, I how do you understand cartography so we can tell its history and then halfway through i had to explode the idea of cartography which <laughs> which makes this whole book rather confusing because i don't think i necessarily edited out the, all the stuff i've written before i realized that cartography sucks um <laughs> so but in that book smith has a very simple statement that for a linguist is absolutely trite um it's a complete truism uh where he's he, Basically, that the users of a system, a linguistic system, are all the same. They're all part of the same system, whether they are writers or readers, speakers or listeners. They're all part of the same system. So, the, so when you think about the mapping community as if it's analogous to a linguistic community, then the people who are producing the maps and the people who are consuming the maps, they're part of the same semiotic system mm. and it doesn't and so when you think about it that way that the, the 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 map itself is circulating between them that's what's joining them together then you can understand a bit more easily how the consumers are creating meaning not because they're coming to this object if it is an object, de novo and go, oh, what's this? No, they're, they're already part and parcel of a system that, that has its own history that has emerged in uh, various ways in accordance to whatever social conditions are, uh, are applicable. And so for me, the, the, the key to understanding mapping historically in the present is to understand that Maps follow. Maps are constituted from multiple forms, multiple strategies. Whether it's strategies of depending, it could be material, immaterial, whatever, and that they circulate. It's the maps that circulate between communities that are defined by that circulation. So we can then start to see how those communities have changed over time. Um, how these little sometimes they're very short-lived. Sometimes they're really long. Sometimes the circuit of communication is really, really tight, most simply when somebody makes a map for themselves, when the the, the pirate book, um, Treasure Island, yes, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Treasure Island. That began as a map that he drew for himself as a kid for no other purpose than to draw a map of a nicely self-contained sonnet-like island that he could then populate with this imagination out of which he ultimately wrote this entire book um, and got really upset when in the, the manuscript of the map got lost and he had to reconstruct the manuscript for putting it at the front of the book <laughs> in print. But in that, in that initial instance where you have a map that is created by one person for themselves. I mean, that's the smallest circuit of communication you can imagine. But then, you know, nowadays, with digital technology, we have uh, completely wide open circuits of communication in which, uh, you know, you stick a map online, uh, interactive thing, like a 
weather map and it goes out to the i mean this truly indeterminate audience uh mass audience that we don't know really really vast um and in some respects, people like to talk about you know uh, web mapping two two point oh the the ability of you, ability of the user to go into a GIS online and make their own maps, as if this is somehow uh, completely new and different. When in reality, it's just a return to older manuscript forms where people go to a draftsman and say, "Hey, make me a map and do these things on it." <laughs> um, just the the the, the we, we we've taken the 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 mediation by the human and turned it into a mediation by a machine, by algorithm. So by thinking about circulation in these ways, I'm not saying that's all we study. We're still studying production. We're still studying consumption, but we're doing so in a way that allows us to historically properly constrain interpretation and at the same time if you do it carefully enough i think it actually allows us to have historical explanation of actual explanation of spatial histories of of changing conceptions over time rather than serious implications or correlations that lack any kind of evidence any, any kind of sort of factual oomph <laughs> well, okay, but uh, the, there are many <laughs> threads I could pick up that I would like to pick up there. But what you're just saying now about as an approach to to studying the history of cartography. So as I mentioned before, you're part of the very wonderful history of cartography project, not just a part, you're the editor. This is, of course, a, a project that started in the 1980s and you you took it over later and the series is ongoing and so i'm curious in a kind of a methodological question now that you're the editor of this project then and it has many contributors of course how do you manage your own point of view and and your you know you you have a strong point of view on how the history of cartography can be or should be done mm -hmm. But yet, yet also this this is a big project and other authors and has its own history already. How do you manage th that that tension between these two poles of uh, something that would be a completely individual project versus a much more collaborative project? That's a really good question and one that a few people ask me. Uh, and there's there's two ways to answer it. One way is the um, historically speaking. Um, the history of the history of cartography project, mm -hmm. and then um, the other way is through the the, the editing process mm -hmm. of the later volumes. So when David and Brian, David Woodward and Brian Harley, conceptualized the history of cartography project, they initially thought of it as four volumes. Um, 1977 is the official statement of, "Huh, we need to do this." And over time, it has grown. Uh, the first volume was going to cover everything that wasn't covered in the th second through fourth volumes, which would be the Renaissance and Enlightenment 19th century. So volume one was going to be ancient, medieval, Asian, indigenous, everything non-modern Western, only modern, modern West. And that didn't go well. <laughs> because one of the things that, that David and Brian did was to push their authors to think about maps in a new way. So rather than thinking about maps as these literal statements of geographic fact, they asked their authors to think about them as images that facilitate an understanding of people, events, places, phenomena, something, something, something in the processes in the past or something like that, and which has sort of become the dominant post-1987 definition of map by many people, for, for many people. And this appears in the preface to Volume 1, published in 1987. And by prodding people to, to do this, um, they generated a lot of really good work, and they didn't feel that they could ever cut it back. Mm -hmm. So Volume 1 rapidly became just class, uh, ancient classical medieval Europe and, Europe and Mediterranean world. 
you know, and it was painful. Uh, the author that was contracted to write a medieval world maps was not good. And so in the end, Woodward had to write that up, that chapter himself. So, which is you know, a great chapter, but um, <laughs> it was very, very painful for David. I witnessed that one uh, firsthand and so on. So, th- so there, there are a number of, of people who, contributors who, who couldn't produce according to the new vision. And they fell by the wayside and get replaced. Typical editorial kind of process. But then they realized they needed to have another, a separate volume for volume two, which had become volume two on traditional Asian societies. Uh, and I came on board just when that, just after that decision was made. And at one degree, David and Brian were still thinking in terms of um, the history of cartography as a summary of what is known. So people can stop just reinventing the wheel, which they were doing a lot of at the time. And so in my actual, my initial interview with Brian, he said, yeah, we're going to have this whole separate chapter for traditional Asian mapping, but it's not going to be very big. It'll be very quick to do because not much has been done on it. So we can be very rapid to, to you know, put it in his own volume. Uh, and then next thing you know, when they actually got people who knew what they were doing to write the, 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 the chapters, it grew into two books, each bigger than volume one. Uh, and then you've got the indigenous volume, which has its own story. Um, so by the time Woodward was by himself, David uh, Brian died in 91. So David finished off volume two, did two books, three on indigenous with Malcolm Lewis, and then really focused on his own, what he always thought of as his own volume, the Renaissance volume. And... Um, he began with that very traditional perspective of the, uh, of the first outlines, which was to have a series of essays about mapping in France and mapping in Britain and mapping in Germany and mapping by the Dutch. And, you know. and he realized after commissioning a million words, he, he persuaded the press to let him go up to a million words for the volume, that uh, he should... He really needed to have interpretive essays. And so he commissioned another 300,000 words of interpretive essays. So maps and literature, maps and art, globes, map printing, printing and distribution of maps, uh, all the things that make up the first part of volume three. And unfortunately, he then becomes ill and wasn't able to then edit down the one million words of regional essays to get to the the whole volume in a million words. So uh, my first job was to raise the money to do a subvention to the press to print the whole thing really big. But even before I took over in 2005, David died in 2004, um, we'd already been talking about how to do the last three volumes. And this, is the, and this is what's getting to your answer, to answer your question. It was very, very clear that we could not pursue the old structure of a series of essays that would somehow cover, let's say for volume four, the European Enlightenment, 1650 to 1800. It would require, you know, four million, five, seven, ten million 10 million words to cover that period in the same, de- quant- same degree of detail as the earlier volumes. Couldn't do it. And at the same time, And by this point, I've been brought on with Mary Pedley as co-editors of Volume 4. By this point, it's also become clear that Volume 6 on the 20th century is going to have to be somehow integrated into the whole. And how then do we do this? How do we keep everything down to a million words, which may sound a lot, but it's not? Um, And in a way that will allow us to go from the 18th century when national trends are, to some degree, quite distinct still, to the 20th century when national differences in mapping practices are completely non-existent, um, well, barely existent. So this is when uh, I come along and say, ha, this is how we do it. So... David already figured out we needed to, to structure these essay, the, these last three volumes as encyclopedias, if only because that way we can, sign, we can assign word limits 
<laughs> to keep people to their word limit. Uh, but then how do you design an encyclopedia? And I argued that we needed to design them around the primary modes of mapping. So rather than just talking about cartography and letting authors talk about marine mapping or map printing or property mapping as they want to, let's differentiate all the diff basic different kinds of mapping and require all of them to be covered. And so we identified nine for volumes four and five. Uh, Mark Momonier for volume six added a couple. But there are the modes that are, uh, that are basically about visualizing space, so geographical mapping, thematic mapping, and, well, from the other side of things, you've got the detailed mapping. So property mapping, topographical place mapping, boundary mapping, and urban mapping, which leaves, for the other side, celestial, geographical, uh, thematic, the, the geodetic, uh, which is a different mode uh, entirely. So I started arguing that we needed to Rather than, rather than have individual authors write about whatever they want about French cartography in the 18th century, which will be all Cassinis all the time, um, let's, have, let's break up cartography into the primary ma mapping modes. Because this is when I was still thinking in terms of cartography as an actual thing. And so in the roundabout 2000, we sat down and I defined nine modes of mapping. And this has been modified since, but we, the design of the history of cartography last three volumes is stuck on, the, on those nine by, by default. Yeah. Um, so from the point of view of, uh, of the big vision of understanding the world, um, there was geographical mapping, celestial mapping, marine mapping, and thematic mapping. From the point of view of more detailed observation and survey, you've got property mapping, topographical mapping or place mapping, uh, urban mapping, and boundary mapping. By boundary mapping is the mapping of uh, political entities, not, not property, but, but the larger polities. And then in addition to that, you've got this practice of geodetic surveying as well, which has its own mode associated with it. So nine modes. And what we would do is structure the essays around these modes. So there's um, – and some other things flo floating out around them. But So the core of volumes four, five, and six, the European Enlightenment, 19th century, 20th century volumes, are these basic modes. And we then look at how each of these map kinds of mapping have been pursued within – national context or, or larger regional context. So in the 18th century volume, we have geographical mapping in the Enlightenment, but then we have more specific entries on geographical mapping in Denmark, Norway, geographic mapping in Austrian monarchy, in Great Britain, in France, in New France, in British North America, and so on. In volume six, we've got geographical mapping, and I don't think Mark Momonier actually subdivided it we do have subdivisions, for example, property mapping. There's property mapping in Asia, property mapping in Africa, property mapping in uh, North America and South America uh, in volume six and 20th century. But this was a way to allow us to have, effectively to turn the, the, the structure on the side and to focus in on different kinds of mapping. So we're implicitly asking people to talk about the communities of consumption as well as the Produce as well as production, and then to allow the the regional context to blur together between four and five and six, mm -hmm. to allow for the internationalization of mapping practices mm -hmm. as you go through into the modern period. So, in effect, what this does, um, I mean, my hope was by asking people to talk about property mapping specifically in an area, um, it would get our authors to write about not just the production, but also 
the consumption, why the maps are made, and, and who, who were the people consuming them. And by and large, that actually worked, even by authors who are really not even interested in the sociocultural approach. They're just still very wedded to the traditional maps as fact kind of, of history. So partly the answer to your question is this pragmatic need to rethink the structure of the volumes. And implicitly, we've structured them around the ideas I'm now arguing. Um, yeah. Because we we restructured them at a point when I was still developing the ideas, so it's not maybe as good as it could be. Certainly, I would do them. Di- I would organize it slightly differently today. As I say in the book, I I identify thirteen modes, not nine. But the second part of the answer then is really working with with authors to help them write something that will mesh with the larger whole. And in, in, in asking for, a, for volume four, which I say I co-edited with Mary Pedley, in there we, we really have a very granular uh, approach. We're looking at you know, mm-hmm. mapping in, a particular kind of mapping in a particular area. Uh, we could really encourage people, if they, if they were reluctant, to address issues of consumption more than it would otherwise do. And and by implication, the sort of the circulation comes out. Sometimes it worked really well. Other times we we, we had to work a bit harder. Um, there was one one small country's authors, several authors wrote on different kinds of mapping, and they all basically gave me the, exactly the same narrative. Um, and so I had to spend a fair amount of time putting apart and reassembling. But the other nice thing about doing an encyclopedia is that the contract, the, the contractual aspects of an encyclopedia are different from a, a, a regular multi-author work in that um, once you've written something, it's actually uh, is written into the contract that the editors can modify to the heart's content. Uh, we always sought permission from authors to make quite sure they, we weren't doing something too bad. And, there were, and ultimately, you know, once we explain what, why we had to do what we had to do, then everybody normally accepted it. You know, and then there's the then there's the big final round when when everything is in and we've read everything, we read it through again, and we just and then you realize, you know, you've caught a number of overlaps. There are, there are certain key maps that everybody wants to reproduce, um, and so we eliminated those. In the first round of editing, um, it was realizing that there are five different maps of the English Channel that are being reproduced. Yeah, you know, it's only like six of them in the 18th century. We go, <laughs> that's it's not that important. Um, yeah, we can do cross. We can reproduce a couple and do cross references to them. Mm. Um, so we had to do a bit of editing like that, just to sort of even out and to fill in fill in holes and eliminate unwarranted. Gaps. So it was a it was a process, which is why it took so long. But it is done for volume four, it's done for volume six, and we are very well advanced on volume five. So yay! Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. I don't want to take much more of your time. I basically have one more question for you. Mm-hmm. You recently wrote a very interesting, uh, should I say, blog post about. The use of maps in games. Yeah. And I was struck by a few things. The one that seems important to me is that you said that these games almost always have an educational aspect to them. Yeah. That, that seems really significant, I think. And then you also connect this with what we mentioned earlier with the rise of the printing industry. Mm-hmm. And then... Also, very importantly, with with war games. Yeah, I, I think the, the, these were for me kind of the. I mean, not uh, objectively speaking, but from my point of view, I thought these were very important points and also interrelated. And then, as an aside, I was wondering at the end, you even uh, go into quite a bit of detail about different board and video and and video games too. So I was wondering is is that something when you're not writing books and not editing the history of cartography project are you playing these games yourself? Oh, no. 
Um, because you're the the way you I, I I enjoy playing games every now and then, and what you wrote about it definitely seemed like an insider's point of view. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> now, when I was a kid, um, we played Risk, but which is how I know why Irkutsk and Yakutsk are. Um, but I've I'm not part of the the. I'm too old for the video game move. Um, that really took off when I was in grad school and in a way that I wasn't – in a community I wasn't part of. I was already too old. Um, and so I know there are some people my age who, who play games, but then they had a different relationship with pop culture growing up than I did. Um, yeah, so I presented this the, the work about – modern games um in a way that with just a few examples and i had to rely on some friends um grand theft also um i do know i uh my wife's cousins are just a bit younger and they were they played the first grand theft auto one christmas when we were there and then i actually did an interview with a gaming magazine about the map in a later edition of grand theft auto Mm -hmm. Which was quite fun. That's that's a limit of my knowledge, really. Okay. Um, and I sort of know about Minecraft, but it's but it's the it's, it's an extension of of spatial thinking of of certain kinds of spatial thinking. And so, what I really liked as I wrote this was the the different kinds of spatial literacies these games are employing, and from the networks and so on. Uh, and then you start getting into um, other subtle points like I, I really couldn't throw in. There are some network games, uh, these railway network games in the 1920s that take the 19th century modernist aesthetic and, it, and they turn it into an art deco aesthetic where the, it's the same basic kind of line, but just the, the quality of the line work is varied. And so whereas before you've got a, a pretty, I mean, it's curved but static, uh, image. You have these games in which the lines themselves are visually very dynamic and, and, and are moving in that, in that wonderful Art Deco kind of way. Um, celebration of movement and all. So those kinds of things. Uh, there's more to Art Deco and mapping than has been written, I assure you. Uh, <laughs> I'm just not qualified to write it. So no, I'm sorry to, so, to, to, to pop your bubble, but I'm not really a game player. Um, and it's more of a celebration of the multiple kinds of space you have on old board games that are all the spatial constructs, whether you know, gridded or hexagonal or network, that get used as the basis for the programming in, 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 uh, in video games, computer games, yeah. No, I was very happy to to come across that post because something that I've been kind of really in the back of my mind, something that I keep thinking about was I read uh, something by Deleuze. It's, it's also just a, a sentence or two where they say that, uh, you know, the, the, the old idea of power was we can compare with chess where you had different roles and functions that were fulfilled by different actors and, and it was... Uh, you know, this very differentiated way in which power worked. Mm-hmm. And they say, but in contrast, modern power is not, it's not a game of chess, but it's the Japanese game of Go, where yeah. all the pieces are interchangeable and it's more about positioning and capturing territory and s- spatial relations rather rather than, I mean, ch- chess also has spatial relations, but it, it also, the pieces have unique functions, which... Uh, in gore the pieces don't have and this for some reason this stuck in my mind and i mm. I'm, every f- once in a while i start to think about it again so when i read your article uh it immediately you know i made that connection and it's very interesting and probably i'm going to keep thinking about it <laughs> much more yeah and there, there there's a way in which international relations have have um latched onto maps that you could describe as being game like the 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 idea in in i r of you know the 
of states that exist. I mean, you've got state birth and you've got state death. So the board is changing. There's so much of IR, you know, at any particular moment, the board is static. And that it's the territorialization is like a, a, a done deal. It's part of the system. Whereas I would like to argue that the territorialization is, again, it's part of this, this constant becoming. Mm. Um, that everything on the board is in flux. It just may not look that way mm. at particular moments. Um, yeah, I always, I, I think I, I agree with that. And that's perhaps one of the, the first instincts I had when I started reading about maps was that I thought that the map was, a. I, I mean, I think this is also Jordan Branch's argument that the map was crucial for kind of communicating some kind of, uh, how, how, how shall I put it, like uh, stability or something fixed yep. in, in place of the reality, which is this, what you said, the becoming or the flux of of politic, politics and space. Yeah, so we can go back to literary historian Richard Helgerson, um, who wrote about the the proliferation of county mapping in late Elizabethan, early Stuart. England as a contribution to the unsettling of political power, that under Elizabeth, you had the rise, even under Henry uh, VIII, you had a rise in images of the country Mm. uh, as if the state was the monarch's estate and that the the idea of a stable uh, country that is somehow natural and defined that is of course the queen rules up to the cheviots i mean this is what england is um the map shows it that way um and forgetting that the whole north of england is a huge frontier zone um mm. going up onto southern scotland um in the, in the early period so but that so you have this idea of a of a, of a so one one kind of mapping being used in one way to promote stability of of the country as a whole but against that you have this equally proliferating even more so proliferating practice of mapping counties that comes out of an administrative administrative functional need of the elizabethan state to marshal an understanding of defenses and risks um so Lord Burley, Elizabeth's great minister, is one of his servants, a guy called Thomas Seckford, came up with the idea of mapping England. Um, and it was done county by county because that was the sort of the political structure, eternal. Mm. Uh, and Burley got copies of all of the first proof uh, printings and heavily annotated them with all sorts of information about people, places, defenses. His personal copy with all his annotations are in the British British Library now. So that that kind of mapping then proliferates under the early Stuarts as a way to promote local sense of place, a sense of the county as opposed to the country. And for Helgeson contributes to the erosion of the stability of the early modern English state, which leads to the civil wars, among up everything else um, that's going on. So, so again, it's not that the map, whatever that might be, mm. causes a certain perception, but rather map particular kinds of maps in particular circuits get used for certain ends and then other maps which might get produced in a different circuit get transferred and then get read differently in the new circuits whether mm. then cir- when versions of them then get circulated so it's a, uh, a far more dynamic um, influx process that's extremely interesting interesting to me and it gives me a lot to think about yeah professor i think i've taken up more than enough of your time well thank you no no thank you very much for speaking to me Uh, i really appreciate it and i hope that when the next history of cartography volume comes out or your next book comes out i i know that you have at least two more planned yes i'd be overjoyed if you could come and talk about them to me again 
Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. This was fun.